welcome to episode 56 of This Week in Germany. We'll be bringing the world to Germany and Germany to the world with news for the week beginning the 26th of January 2015. My name's Daniel. And my name's Rob. Each week we bring you stories from the news, society and culture in the English language. If you want to find out more, including ways to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Spreaker and SoundCloud, head over to our website thisweekingermany.de. The government's top politicians and business people flock to the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. We'll be breaking down the developments from the past few days with Deutsche Welle's head of business, Manuela Kasper Claridge, who is in Davos. Despite their leaders stepping down and tens of thousands across the country attending counter demonstrations, the anti Islam, anti immigrant group Pegida is still going strong. We'll be listening to a rare interview with Pegida's founder, Lutz Bachmann. Our German of the Week is Nelson Müller, the Ghana-born chef who struggled to the top has earned him a Michelin star and, last Tuesday, 6 million TV viewers. Our destination this week is Gieselverde's town within a town. All that, plus the rest of the week's news in brief, coming up. So let's get started with story one. This week, everyone's attention was focused on the World Economic Forum, which takes place each year in Davos, Switzerland. The WEF receives the world's top politicians, economists, business people, financial leaders, as well as prominent representatives of other issues, including the environment and healthcare. This week also saw some big news for Europe. The European Central Bank, which administers the monetary policy of the Eurozone, announced it would be injecting 1.1 trillion euros into the economy using quantitative easing. Before we find out more, what is quantitative easing? QE, as it is also known, is essentially where a central bank prints more money. It doesn't have to be physical banknotes, but rather increasing the numbers on a computer, to put it simply. This move is seen as controversial because debt-ridden countries like Greece stand to gain support from QE, despite the biggest contributors to the European Central Bank being Germany and France. It can also impact pensions and savings, plus it could increase income and wealth inequality. On the other hand, it helps to keep interest rates low and encourages people to borrow and spend money. This has made quantitative easing a big topic in the Eurozone this week. It was also a point of discussion for Germany at the World Economic Forum. Joining us on the phone now from Davos is Manuela Kasper Claridge, Deutsche Welle's Head of Business and Science, to tell us more about 2015's WEF. Manuela, for those who don't know, how important is the World Economic Forum and what were the key topics this year? Well, the World Economic Forum is a very important business venue, of course, but this year we have a great participation of uh, not just business leaders, also of politicians. There are over 300 ministers and presidents here, also Angela Merkel of Germany or, I don't know, from South Africa, Jacob Zuma, and many, many more, Shimon Peres and so on. But as you probably hear in the background, Davos is also a showcase for countries who want, which want to advertise for themselves. Like uh, at the moment, Malaysia is holding a big party here, inviting all Davos participants, and that's over 2,000, to celebrate with them that they are chair of a Asian. And so you see, it is also a party and it's not just about politics or business. But regarding the topics, of course, this is not as bright as the parties here because uh, there's a gloomy outlook for the world economy and the world is in the crisis and that is the subject many people discuss here in Davos. So both uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel and uh, the Finance Minister Wolfgang Schäuble have attended the WEF this year. What did they have to say? What kind of message did they, did they bring to the forum? Well, first, first of all, it was not just, not just the Chancellor and the Finance Minister, but six more members of the German cabinet. So you see that obviously this venue was quite important for them. But Germany is uh, the G7 chair this year, and so... They wanted to emphasize on the topic Germany wants to push. One is, of course, uh, how to tackle climate change. Then uh, Germany wants to make clear that it will be a powerful economy in Europe, which is acting very considerate in the way that it 
washes its spending, that it's going for austerity and not so much for spending more money when they don't have it. And Chancellor Merkel had a huge audience here. The, the, it was packed, actually. And she also commented on the crisis in Ukraine and on the situation in Greece. In Ukraine, as you know, there's this conflict going on and the Europeans are putting pressure on Russia to stop the conflict there. And so this was such good news and uh, German Chancellor said she will stand and Germany will stand with the Ukrainian people in their fight for independence and democracy. I, I also know that um, Germany has an opinion on uh, Greece's position in the Eurozone as well. I mean, that's all also been brought up in uh, uh, the World Economic Forum this year. Yes, of course. Greece was a topic, although nobody uh, from Greece uh, was here, not the Prime Minister or any other uh, representatives. But it's understandable because the election is obviously this weekend, so they have to be in Greece and not here. Uh, but Yes, uh, there was a discussion, and uh, Germany said that it is absolutely convinced that Greece will stay in the Eurozone, and Germany will do everything it can to help Greece. Yes, and Angela Merkel said that Greece must pay back its debt. Some were saying that perhaps um, they Angela Merkel... Yeah, but she didn't say how quickly uh, they have to pay it back and so on, and I think the Germans are much more relax or the German government, as that's what I heard, then probably uh, the press is printing it at the moment. Because don't forget, Greece is, is a small economy. It's, Greece can't bring the Eurozone down, you know? What's more important is that France is doing its job, that France is gaining momentum again, also business-wise, that's much more important for the Eurozone than the situation in Greece. So, speaking of the Eurozone, this week the European Central Bank announced a huge boost in quantitative easing in the Eurozone um, of over 1 trillion euros, basically injecting 1 trillion euros into the economy is how I would describe it. Uh, this move has been heavily criticized by some, including the CSU's finance expert and people you know, across the, the political spectrum, I would say. What was the reaction in Davos and what will this mean for Germany? Well... There, is, there are many people here from, from, from the United States, from, from Britain and so on, and uh, many investment bankers and bankers in, generally, in general. And they said, well, that's something that was expected, obviously, from the European Central Bank. Any other move, like, for example, they wouldn't have done quantitative easing now, would have been much worse because that would have surprised the markets, and the markets don't like surprises. So the bankers here said, okay, now it's been done, and now we can see what is going to happen. Of course, there's a debate, is this really necessary? And we have, like, two groups. We have one group, more than a single group. There's Germany. There's some people from, from, from the Netherlands and uh, from Finland. They are saying austerity is much more important. There's enough liquidity in the market. And then there are others, they say, okay, we have deflation or we have the fear uh, or the possibility of deflation and we have to fight it with more money in the market. Well, I can't tell you what's true. We will only uh, know in probably one year or so uh, who was right and who was wrong. To finish off, would you say that there is an optimistic atmosphere for the future at uh, this year's World Economic Forum? Well, actually, the general world outlook for the world economy is not terribly bad. You know, it's quite good, actually. Um, there's a growth expected of 2.5%, I think. And it's, it's mixed. It depends how the crisis is in some countries, how they will develop and then probably also affect other countries and affect the world economy. Nobody knows now how it will go, for example, in Syria with the refugees situation, that's a problem. Then Ukraine and Russia and many more conflicts also in Africa. So it all depends how it goes, if we are able, as the world is able, to solve these problems in a peaceful way. And we don't know yet. Obviously, it's the beginning of the year. So Manuela Kasper-Claridge from Deutsche Welle, thank you very much for joining us here on This Week in Germany.
Jó vagyok. Now for this week's news in brief. The German national who had been working as a teacher and then kidnapped in Nigeria has been released this past week. A television station owned by the state in the neighboring country of Cameroon released the story. They quoted their president, Paul Baya, who said the German national had was recovered this past Wednesday when Cameroon's army and security service worked together on a special operation. Martin Schaefer of the German Foreign Office in Berlin said that the freed hostage has now been transferred to a hospital in Cameroon's capital, Yaoundé. No word yet if the kidnapped victim will stay abroad or return to Germany. The group behind the kidnapping was an Islamist terrorist group named Boko Haram. We just heard an interview with Deutsche Welle's correspondent about the World Economic Forum that took place in Davos, Switzerland. Angela Merkel is trying to balance keeping the conflict in Ukraine peaceful and keeping the trading problems between the EU and Russia under control. At the forum, she mentioned that if the problem in Ukraine were solved, trade talks could possibly start on cooperation for a joint free trade area. No formal offers for negotiations have yet been made with Russia. Germany and the EU are expecting a resolution for the conflict in Ukraine before the possibility of a joint free trade agreement. In Germany, Many people break a law that's rarely enforced. The law is operating a bicycle while after consuming alcohol. Currently, there is a hard or absolute legal level of alcohol consumption that can be measured if one is allowed to ride a bicycle. That number is 1.6 parts per thousand. Now, experts are asking for that limit to be lowered, as a lower limit could, in theory, make German streets safer. They will be making this plea to the German Council on Jurisdiction of Transportation. These experts, as well as groups like the General German Bicycle Club, the ADFC, say that riding while intoxicated not only puts the rider at risk, but also other riders and pedestrians. The club says that the absolute law should stay at 1.6 parts per thousand, but the police should start giving fines for dangerous behavior starting at 1.1 part per thousand. Though not everyone believes the same thing. The German Lawyers Association, the DAV, have said that the law shouldn't be altered. Those driving motor vehicles while intoxicated put real people's lives in danger, while bicycling only really risks the cyclist. Soon, a decision on which city in Germany will be able to put in a bid to host the 2024 Summer Olympic Games will be made. The competing cities this year are Berlin and Hamburg. The mayor of Berlin, Michael Müller, went all out and set up an illumination on the Brandenburg Gate to show the city's spirit. The slogan read, We want the games! Berlin for Olympia! and it was decorated in the Olympic colors. The winning city, between Hamburg and Berlin, will be announced on March 21st. The city that does win it within Germany will then hold a referendum for discussions and planning and taking the public's vote if they want to host the Olympic Games, before actually submitting a bid for the Olympic Games. In the referendum, the vote is not a sure thing. A YouGov survey does expect that this year, half the voters in Berlin to be against the referendum. If the referendum does fail, the city will not put in an official bid. Something similar happened to Munich for the 2022 Winter Games where the referendum was not passed. The deadline for the final submissions is September 15th. And that's it for this week's News in Brief. If you'd like a quick and simple way to keep up with the latest from Germany, sign up for our weekly email newsletter. You can find it on our website, thisweekingermany.de. It's been a regular topic on This Week in Germany, but continues to be important and its impact has not gone unnoticed by international news media. They call themselves Patriotische Europäer gegen die Islamisierung des Abendlandes, or PEGIDA for short. In English, Patriotic Europeans against the Islamization of the West. The BBC's Katrin Nye has followed the rise of Pegida and set out to understand the causes of the movement and the effects that their anti-Islam and anti-immigrant sentiment could have on Germany. In a rare interview, she spoke with the founder of Pegida, Lutz Bachmann. The leadership of Pegida have been notoriously reluctant about giving interviews to what they call the lying press, but we managed to get their founder, Lutz Bachmann, to agree to meet us at a hotel in the city. Lutz has a criminal record. 
convictions for assault and theft in his youth, and more recently for possession of cocaine. His suspended sentence for that is about to expire. He's a tall, well-built man whose bold speeches to thousands about the erosion of Christian values I've watched online. I'm from Dresden, working in an advertising company, and I'm one of the founders of Pegida. Pegida basically means patriotic Europeans against Islamization of the evening land. can translate in German, it's Abendland, means Western Europe. Our organization is against the Islamization of the evening land, not against Islam as a religion. It's the main thing what always is going to be from the media and so on. They're always telling anti-Islam, anti-Islam, anti-Islam. We are not anti-Islam, against Islamization and radical Islam. That's two different things. Speaking to people going on the demonstrations, this is not the kind of thing they're talking about. People are talking about having economic problems, having problems with the government. Some people are talking about problems with refugees. There's a lot of different grievances people seem to have and they're going on your demos to express themselves. Do you worry that your message is a bit diluted? It's not very clear what you want? No, not at all. I think this was just a reason to start it. And then from week to week, there come no problems and the people are upset with the government in Germany. And that's why they came to us and said, listen, you are our chance to get the politicians to listen to us. Why Islamization? It doesn't seem like that's actually what a lot of people are concerned about. So why are you using that? A lot of people got fears about Islamization, really a lot of people. But here in Saxony, or in, in, especially in Dresden, we don't have these problems yet. But we are not anymore in the, like we call it in Germany, Tal der Ahnungslosen. We've got now TV, we've got everything. We see what happens in France, in Belgium, in the Netherlands in Europe, and we don't want to even wait until this happens here. So you're just stoking people's fears, basically? No, not at all. The fears are there. What do you want? What's your end game? Change in politics. We want a uh, lot of things. Yesterday evening I told six points to the politicians that they can talk with us and they can show us, OK, we are interested in changing something for the people. Can you tell me those? The six points? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Lutz reads out his six demands in German. They are immigration based on quality, a law requiring integration, deportation of jihadists, direct democracy, the end of warmongering against Russia and more money for security. Which is the most important point of your six demands? Direct democracy. Okay, so you have democracy in Germany at the moment. What do you direct want to change? Direct democracy, public referendum. We don't even have the right we don't have the constitutional right to vote on everything, on anything. And this has to be in our constitution. What are you scared of if things don't change? My greatest fear is uh, Germany becomes like uh, parts of Germany already are, like Berlin, like Offenbach, where parallel societies are busy growing. There are parallel courts, like Sharia courts. We have a law in Germany, so we don't need Sharia courts. What are your personal views about Islam? I don't care. Religion is a private thing. I've got a lot of Muslim friends and they are always telling me your government is doing wrong. If you would do the same as a Christian in our countries where we come from, you would get stoned or you would get killed or whatever. You say you have Muslim friends, you're not against Islam. Does it make you feel guilty that Muslims are scared to come out when your demonstrations are happening? Show me one that is scared. I've got a photo on my phone, if you like. I've <laughs> got an interview. Do you want to see? One, how many Muslims? Well, we went to a large mosque that mm. has a congregation of around 500 people mm. in Dresden that's near your march that closed because people are too scared to go to pray. So that's not freedom of religion, which you say mm. is what you want. People now Didn't can't go and it. worship. If because 20... you're always trying to put me in this no, direction. No, 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 no. That's why I'm I asking... break up now, yeah? I'm asking you. Always you... Try. you always I'm asking try. you no, if you feel bad. No, you're not bad. asking. You're telling me. Do you feel guilty that Muslims are scared to come out of their homes they, when your marches are happening? They don't have to be scared. But there's 25,000 people saying they don't like the way their religion is influencing Germany. Obviously, right, they're going to be they're scared. They're not talking about the people. But they are Point. scared. Does that bother you? They don't have to be scared. Point. At this point, Lutz Barkman asked me to leave, saying my questions were unfair. 
After our interview, a photo was made public showing him dressed up as Hitler. It ended up on the front page of a national German newspaper and he resigned from Pegida the same day. That interview was a clip from the BBC radio documentary Germany, Islam and the New Right. The reporter was Katrin Nye and was produced by Samita Patel. The researcher was James Melly. You can hear the documentary in full at bbc.co.uk slash radio, or you can find the direct link on our website. Coming up right now is Destination Germany. We're taking you on a journey somewhere in the country that is well worth a visit. Whether you're a tourist, a permanent resident, a foreigner, or a German citizen, we'll be covering the famous sites as well as the little-known corners of Deutschland. All that matters is showing you that Germany is an interesting and exciting place to visit. If you enjoy the destinations that we talk about each week, check out our website, thisweekingermany.de, and we'll have photos of each week's destination. In our last episode, we told you all about the great city which has some unique culture. It's the city of Görlitz, Germany's easternmost city. Right on the border of Poland and only 10 kilometers from the Czech Republic, this city shares cultures from all three nations. Also, as the city has been around a long time and survived the Second World War intact, it's a great place to visit to see the different architectural styles from throughout the ages. While not one of the largest cities in Germany, it definitely has a lot of character, making it a nice place to visit. So what's on the agenda for this week's destination? This week we're going to another small town. A town that is smaller than Görlitz. In fact, this region is tiny in terms of population. So why would I want to take you to such a small town? Well, the surprise is that within this small town is an even smaller town, which I'll get to soon. This week, we're going to start at the municipality of Overweser. I guess most people have most likely never heard of this little area. So why don't you start off by telling us where it is? The area is at the very tip top of the German state of Hesse. It is right on the border of Lower Saxony and close to Thuringia as well. Oberwesa has about 40 square kilometers and the population is a little more than 3,000. It has six villages. Out of these six villages, we're going to the largest one with just over a thousand residents, Gieselwerder. That sounds like quite of an, uh, an out-of-the-way place, if you know what I mean. Most likely a place where people live to get away from it all and just commute to larger towns for work or their other needs. So it doesn't really sound like a busy, happening place. So why have you chosen this as, as our travel destination this week? Well, first, the land around Gieselwerde is beautiful. It has it all. Rolling fields mountains, and a scenic river, the River Weser. Because of this, the entire town is a nationally recognized vacation spot and health resort in the Weser uplands. The health resort offers climate therapy and the region's naturally fresh air. Many of the buildings in the villages are the iconic Fachwerkhäuser, or in English, half-tempered houses and buildings, where you can see the structure's beams from the outside. But not to worry. Just because it's a resort area, you're not going to be overwhelmed with a sea of tourists. There are only about 150 beds available in the entire town, including the hotels and bed and breakfast rentals. You mentioned something a little strange at the beginning of this segment. You said that this is a smaller town inside another small town. So do you mean it's Gieselwerde inside of the Oberwiese area, or what did you mean? Okay, that is a good guess, but what I'm actually referring to is a cool attraction inside the village of Gieselwerde. It's called Der Mühlenplatz. It's a showcase of miniature versions of many of the different buildings in the area from today and in the past. It began as just a hobby for a local that liked to build miniature replicas and it turned into a large open-air museum that is well worth a visit. Visitors can walk around the area and see tiny castles, buildings, houses, churches, and of course mills. The detail is extraordinary and the experience will leave you feeling like a giant walking across the land. Do you have any recommendations on how to get to this small village and its miniature counterpart? Yes. Remember that this is not a huge city, so plan your transportation ahead of time. If you're not driving, I recommend that you go to one of the larger cities like Göttingen or Kessel. From there, you can find a bus that'll take you to Gieselwerder. If you want to relax in a health resort or have the desire to feel like a giant looking down on the land, check out Gieselwerder in the Oberweser area. 
Next up, our German of the Week section, where we put the spotlight on a prominent person from this week's news, a German citizen, or even a foreigner who we deem an honorary German, who's had an effect, for better or worse, on German culture, society, or politics. This episode's German of the Week is a German chef, restaurant owner, and he's also a singer. His name is Nelson Müller, and he's a classic rags-to-riches story, which borders on being a fairy tale. His birth name is Nelson Nuttekor, and he moved to Germany at four years old with his parents from Ghana. Soon, he was put into a foster home in Stuttgart. His foster parents adopted Nelson, and he officially changed his last name to Müller. Nelson Müller trained as a cook under the famous German chef Holger Bodendorf. From there, he was able to work in several high-class restaurants over the next decade. In 2009, he opened his own restaurant called Pepper. Since then, he has opened two other chic restaurants. He has become a minor celebrity being on television as a chef. He started on a local show called The Red Apron. He found that he had talent not only for being a superior chef, but also as a TV actor. He starred in more cooking programs and recently hosted a ZDF special that compared discount grocery stores in Germany, like Lidl or Aldi, against his high-quality standards for food. The show was extremely popular and had almost 6 million views, tuning in while it aired this past Tuesday. And that's the end of episode number 56. We'd like to thank you for leaving your ratings and reviews on iTunes. This one from D. Ami in the United States version of iTunes reads... I was an exchange student in Leipzig and Stuttgart, and this podcast is my favorite way to keep up with German news since I've been back. This podcast provides a great summary of events, along with awesome features such as Destination Germany. It's a really great way to expose yourself to German history and culture. The hosts balance sounding professional and personable, and you can tell they're passionate about what they're doing. Thumbs way up. Thanks for the review, Diami. If you're an iTunes subscriber, please leave us a rating or review. It's one of the ways you can help support our podcast for free. And it helps us find more listeners. Plus, we might even read them out on the program. This Week in Germany is produced by me, Daniel Winter. It is written and presented by myself and Rob Bishop. And our business correspondent this week was Deutsche Welle's Manuela Kasper Claridge, who you can follow on Twitter at Manuela KC. In the interview with Lutz Bachmann was a clip from the BBC radio documentary Germany, Islam, and the New Right. The reporter was Katrin Nye, the producer was Samita Patel, and the researcher was James Melly. Thank you for those at the BBC involved in the production who gave us permission to include the interview in our program. You can find a link to the full documentary on our website or visit the website bbc.co.uk slash radio. If you'd like to get in touch, subscribe to us in iTunes, get weekly email updates, or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Spreaker, or SoundCloud. All the details are at thisweekingermany.de. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next Monday with more of This Week in Germany.